Kaylee, thank you so much. And a live look at Emory University in Atlanta, where President Biden and all five living first ladies are bidding farewell to Rosalind Carter, who passed away last week at the age of 96. Hello, I'm John Roberts in Washington. It is a solemn ceremony, but quite a celebration of life. And a beautiful sight there in Atlanta. Good to be with you, John. I'm Sandra Smith in New York, and this is America Reports. Rosalind's beloved husband, former President Jimmy Carter, is expected to leave mm -hmm. hospice care to attend today's memorial service. It is set to get underway any moment now. The Carters were married for more than 77 years, becoming the nation's longest married presidential couple. And since her death, tributes from across the country have been praising Rosalind's decades of work, her better, better mental health care, and her integral role in her husband's political rise and his time in the White House. Let's bring in Carl Rowe, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and Juan Williams, Fox News senior political analyst. Let's start off with you, Carl, because the fact that Jimmy Carter is coming out of hospice care to say goodbye to his beloved wife really does put a cap on what is an extraordinary love story here, as well as a political one. Absolutely. They knew each other as children. They married early. And she was an integral part of everything that he did in public service, from his first race for the uh, Georgia State Senate, his failed governorship race, his return to success in his first winning race for governor, to his presidency and his, and his time after the presidency. She was not only his wife, but also a key advisor and uh, and uh, helped shape his career and, and his life after the White House, played an extraordinary role for our country, both as First Lady and as an advocate for mental health. Um, lots of people have uh, enjoyed greater li and better lives, and uh, many people have been saved from, uh, uh, from suicide by her active involvement in helping uh, allow us as a country to have an open dialogue about mental health and, and offer mm -hmm. solutions to it. Really interesting, Carl. Um, thank you for that. Juan, uh, President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden, uh, longtime friends of the Carters, uh, they will lead the list of dignitaries joining the widowed former president there in Atlanta. Uh, we know that former President Bill Clinton, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, along with former First Ladies Melania Trump, Michelle Obama, and Laura Bush will be there to pay their respects in person. Your thoughts in this moment as we await the ceremony there in Atlanta. Now, Sandra, I thought it was really important what you just said about the presence of so many former first ladies across the political aisle. You know, it was Rosalind Carter who created the office of the first lady at the White House. She was the first first lady to have a press secretary and left notes for Mrs. Reagan, uh, you know, their successor, with regard to how to conduct uh, the White House to make it a national treasure, uh, especially this Christmas season. Uh, we keep in mind that the, yesterday the Bidens decorated the house in such a way. And again, it was Rosalind Carter who had the idea that you had to maintain this White House in a very specific, honored way for the imagination of the American people. I remember when I first came to Washington, this was 1976, it was just after they were elected. Um, and, you know, one thing that stands out is, as a young man, I was told, no hard liquor in the White House. <laughs> no, I, they only made U.S. Um, brand wines available and less in the way of state dinners, more in the way of picnics. And uh, this was Rosalind Carter, who was then really known as, and I'm not sure it was known, you know, publicly, but as Steel Magnolia, because she was quite charming and low-key in her tone and her southern accent. But in terms of White House personnel and her own agenda and her influence on President Carter, she was known as a steely presence. That's why she was nicknamed that steel magnolia. <laughs> and, you know, she came from very humble roots, Juan, as, as we all know, and she never forgot uh, where she came from either, even though she, you know, walked the hallowed halls of the White House. Carl, uh, Jimmy Carter entered hospice care back in February of this year, and at the time, because he'd been suffering from brain cancer, we thought that, oh, perhaps he doesn't have that long to live. Brian Kemp there, the governor of Georgia, entering along with the first lady of Georgia. Um, but he hung in there, just turned 99. And his grandson, Jason, offered some insight into that when he said about Jimmy, he's coming to the end and he's very, very physically diminished. But I think he was proud and happy that he was there for her, Rosalind, until the very end. And he wasn't going to miss this for anything. And you, and you have to wonder, Carl, as we were talking about, the fact that they've known each other 
since they were kids. They were married for 77 years. Jimmy Carter, despite his declining health, hung in there so that he could be there for Rosalind in this moment. I mean, that's an incredible story. Yeah, what a, what a sweet commentary on their relationship. Uh, and, and think about it, he was 22 and I think she was 19 when they married. Uh, an extraordinary life. Uh, and, and you're right, they both came from humble circumstances, uh, lived in Plains, Georgia. And what was interesting was when they finished their time in Washington, where did they go? Back to Plains, Georgia, not Atlanta. They, they, they were active in the Carter Center in, in Atlanta, but they, they lived in the house that they had uh, built and uh, as a young couple in, in Plains, Georgia, as he ran the family's peanut business. And uh, a remarkable uh, story, but I, I agree with you. Just I could just see the former president uh, who, she was a steel magnolia, but he also had rather firm opinions as every president who followed him found out because Jimmy Carter was, has not been afraid to make his opinions known, particularly on the international stage, regardless of what the current administration may think at the time. Fair enough but, point uh, there, Juan. Really wonderful. Um, Carl, great point. Juan, to that point, um, looking back at the, the, the Carter's marriage, um, it is one for the record books. They married in 1946. Uh, they're 77 years together makes them the longest married presidential couple in U.S. history. Uh, their grandson, Jason Carter, is set to speak there today in Atlanta. He has said, quote, my grandmother, in addition to being a partner to my grandfather, was a force on her own. Uh, Jason, their grandson himself, a former state senator and one-time Democratic nominee for governor, called her the best politician in the family. It was a <laughs> distinction, Juan, that Jimmy Carter never disputed. I don't think I don't think many people would dispute this. You know, when you talk about her in terms of that official role, uh, you can't get away from the fact that she was the first first lady uh, since Eleanor Roosevelt to testify in Congress. And this gets back to what Carl was talking about in terms of her willingness to talk about mental health issues, to talk about reaching out to Americans who may be dealing with drugs and other issues. Uh, and there she was in front of the Congress making testimony that had impact, traveling uh, to go visit foreign countries even to carry that message. And of course, again, picking up on what we've been saying, even after the White House, working on mental health issues, creating fellowships at the Carter Center in Atlanta for journalists and others dealing with mental health and caring issues, uh, and even beyond that, obviously, and I think this is the most famous, wearing those uh, construction hats with Jimmy Carter as they went to work to build housing, uh, you know, a hospice for America. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Habitat for America, excuse me. So she, she passed away in hospice care in Plains, and uh, she was then transported to the Carter Presidential Library in Atlanta, where she lay in repose. And Carl, over the course of time that she was there, hundreds upon hundreds of people came by to pay their respects. You, you usually hear that for uh, a president or a, a very famous politician, not so much for a first lady, which I really think shows the depth of admiration that people, particularly in her native Georgia, had for her. Yeah, well, thousands of people. And look, for her, you know, you understand it. For, she was a very open and accessible person. She was as the First Lady of Georgia. She was as First Lady of the United States. And even in her years afterwards, as you say, as she was a visible figure on the scene, mm -hmm. mental health, Habitat for Humanity, the work of the Carter Center in promoting peace uh, around the world. These were things that were important to her husband and they were important to her. They may have been important to her husband because they were important to her. <laughs> and she, she played a very public role, but a very open uh, person. People in Atlanta told me she, they were, it was not uncommon to see her uh, at public things in earlier years after they left the White House when she was more active but uh, a marvelous human being and a great example for, for our country. As, as uh, Jimmy Carter equipped just recently uh, to the Associated Press, I believe it was in 2021, Juan, he said, my wife is much more political than I am. Um, in addition to the current President Biden, uh, former President Bill Clinton also in attendance there today, they will be at least, um, the attendees are expected to include Vice President Kamala Harris, her, her husband, uh, Jill Biden, as we mentioned, um, the former First Lady, Secretary of 
state Hillary Clinton, uh, Laura Bush, Michelle Obama, Melania Trump. As we just saw walk in a moment ago, uh, the governor, Brian Kemp, has arrived with Georgia's first lady, Marty Kemp. Uh, Mayor Andre Dickens of Atlanta also expected. None of these high-profile attendees are scheduled to speak. This is going to be, we are told, a focus on the family and her memory, Juan. They are going to reflect on uh, Mrs. Carter's taste, we are told, for simple elegance over modern glitz. And it will very much be, Juan, a personal message about the former First Lady. You know, I think all of us could be honored if our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren uh, chose to speak at our you know, funerals, uh, and I think that's what we're going to see today, is family speaking mm -hmm. about personal love, uh, the kind of love that uh, Mrs. Carter demonstrated when she went to visit her husband of 77 years while he was in hospice. He went into hospice in February mm -hmm. and still survives as we speak, uh, you know, age 98. But it was Rosalind who went to visit him. And I remember once hearing from him about their fishing contest, Sandra, and that she was not just kindly sitting there while he was fishing, but that they would have competitive fishing contest and that she was a better fisherman than that <laughs> Southern Georgia kid, uh, Jimmy Carter. So I think you have a sense that this relationship and the fact of family speaking today tells you something about, you know, that the essence of her was as you know, it, it, you can't redeem the kind of love that is reflected in the success of a family. You know, while we were, we were speaking just a moment ago with Carl about the idea that uh, Jimmy Carter's family firmly believes that he hung in there despite his declining health and his innumerable medical problems in order to see his beloved wife off. At, at, at some point, I mean, Jimmy Carter has defied the odds here. Oh, yeah. Diagnosed with brain cancer in his mid-1990s uh, and has survived it this long. Uh, at some point, we will be telling his story, and um, hopefully, it's not going to be for years to come. It would be great to see him celebrate his 100th birthday. But, but as uh, was the case with Ronald and Nancy Reagan, you know, an inseparable couple, and she was very much uh, the person who protected him as well as supported him. Compare that relationship to the relationship that Jimmy and Rosalind had. Well, I think the key here is what you said, that she protected. I think it's, it's the case with both Rosalind Carter and with Mrs. Reagan, Nancy Reagan, that they really saw themselves there as a companion and a protector for someone who was in the public spotlight and a spotlight that can be excruciatingly brash and harsh. Uh, so the difference would be that Mrs. Car Carter was not one to have the kind of public, you know, Los Angeles, California type of presence that Mrs. Reagan did. Mrs. Reagan knew celebrities and would invite people in, and it would be quite the celebration to have an invitation from Nancy Reagan. And, and you know, people at state dinners, state dinners took on a new significance with Nancy Reagan in town. With, with Mrs. Carter, it was kind of the flip in that, yes, she's protective and she's looking out for Jimmy and she's representing Jimmy and she's in front of Congress, but she's always trying to play it down, kind of in the background a little bit. And at times, Nancy Reagan was in the foreground. Yeah. Uh, for reading directly from her family statement, upon her passing, uh, Rosalind Carter's deep compassion for people everywhere and her untiring strength on their behalf touched lives around the world. We have heard from thousands of you, her family says, since her passing. They thank you all for joining us and celebrating what a treasure she was, not only to us, but to all humanity.